Hi, I wanted to review some of the stuff from uh, class uh, yesterday, the 5th. Um, so we talked about risk factors and disease markers, um, which is a review of some things that we talked about before, um, and also genetic risk factors versus, um, uh, un versus different brain structures um, uh, and others, how each can be a risk factor. Um, and then we talked about resistance factors in general, um, how this is either, again, genetic or as a consequence of some genetics, some uh, other sort of brain change, either activity or size of different areas, and the change in this activity or size um, might be something that's specifically unusual about relatives. And so those relatives who even share some of the same genes and some of the same environment um, as the individuals who develop a disease might have some extra unusual feature that is protecting them from also getting the disease, and that's a resistance factor. Um, we talked about one particular research study looking at um, uh, risk factors and resistance markers, the SIMSX study, um, and like all the studies we've talked about that look for the difference between risk factors and disease markers, there's a set of controls, um, a set of probands, people with the disease, in this case bipolar, and then healthy relatives. Um, and in this case, they were measuring sizes of brain areas instead of activity um, differences. And then for risk factors, then we expect those things to be common, uh, uh, something that's different from controls, which is common between both the patients and healthy siblings. Um, and that's because it shows, um, uh, because this is because of the genetics and associated with the risk of a disease. A disease marker or a biomarker is something that will be um, uh, a difference that is unique to patients with uh, the particular disease, so just in the bipolar patients, um, but not something in the siblings or controls. So that's already one thing that differentiates um, the people with the disease from the uh, uh, healthy siblings. Um, but in the case of a disease marker, um, it's only in the people with the disease. Uh, that's why it's called a disease marker. Um, by contrast, a resistance factor is something that is going to be unique in the healthy siblings. Um, the controls and the patients will be similar on the measure of size of a particular brain area, but then if there's a, there's a particular brain area that is unusually different in the siblings um, that are healthy, then that is indicating that what it, that, um, that that is part of what differentiates the healthy siblings from the people with the disease, um, and therefore is indicative of um, being resistant to the disease. Um, we then went on to talk about schizophrenia, symptoms of schizophrenia, delusions and hallucinations, the so-called positive symptoms, as well as negative symptoms, lack of affect, um, uh, uh, completely disorganized behavior, and um, loss of cognitive function, uh, as illustrated by disorganized thought and disorganized speech. Um, we also I introduced briefly dendritic spines, these connection points, these little bumps on dendrites where synapses are made. That's something that we're going to talk about today in class. Um, but then we spoke uh, for a little while about treatments for um, bipolar, or sorry, treatments for schizophrenia. Actually, this uh, uh, can also be used as treatments for bipolar disorder. Um, uh, so um, treatments for for schizophrenia are divided into two classes, the so-called typical antipsychotics, which are fairly selective for um, D2 antagonists. And these are especially effective at decreasing positive symptoms. Um, but because they're blocking dopamine, they can also interfere with cognitive function and attention. They can interfere with the ability to experience pleasure. And also, uh, and so those connections, those two things, the, the two projections of the nucleus accumbens can worsen the cognitive symptoms, the frontal lobe projection block, um, and the um, negative symptoms by blocking the nucleus accumbens dopamine receptors. Um, blocking receptors in the striatum can lead to difficulty with movement, and these are called extraparameter symptoms, although that's not a term you need to know for this class. Um, and this uh, drug-induced Parkinsonism, tremor, slow movement, because it's somewhat similar to Parkinson's disease. In the case of Parkinson's disease, the substantial nigra cells are dying. In the case of uh, 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 typical antipsychotics, we're blocking some of the signal from the substantial nigra to the nucleus accumbens. Uh, sorry, from the substantial nigra to the striatum. Um, the atypical antipsychotics also almost all have D2 antagonism, but they're uh, not selective. And instead, um, they also have various effects, sometimes blocking, sometimes enhancing, sometimes changing reuptake on many other neurotransmitter receptors and neurotransmitters. Um, and uh, depending on which neurotransmitters the atypical antipsychotics also function on, um, this can lead to different changes in, um, uh, in um, the brain and um, can perhaps help with uh, mood problems. Um, so that can either 
be a better treatment for um, schizophrenia with a lot of negative symptoms, um, or it can um, uh, have at least not the same unpleasant side effects as uh, typical antipsychotics. Um, however, there are other side effects that come along with atypical antipsychotics. Um, and so as with any medication, it's important to be careful and take the right doses um, and be aware of the potential side effects and monitor um, uh, progress uh, and, and treatment and so on. Um, one other quick aside from uh, is, is this sort of distinction here between um, schizoaffective disorder, which is essentially schizophrenia plus a mood disorder, um, and bipolar disorder um, with psychotic features, or major depressive disorder with psychotic features. So um, sometimes um, delusions and or hallucinations can come along with bipolar, and you can also have delusions or hallucinations with major depressive disorder. Um, on the surface of it, it seems like schizoaffective disorder, which could be delusions and hallucinations plus a mood disorder, sounds very similar to bipolar disorder in, with psychotic features and major depressive disorder with psychotic features. Um, there are two main differences. One is that um, uh, typically the psychotic features are less severe um, in bipolar with psychotic features or major depression. Um, and also, um, when somebody has, say, bipolar disorder with psychotic features, once the bipolar symptoms are controlled, the psychotic features go away on their own, um, whereas schizoaffective disorder would require uh, treatment for both the mood disorder and the schizophrenia symptoms. Similarly, major depressive disorder with psychotic features, um, once, the psychotic, uh, uh, once, the depressive, um, uh, once the depression is treated, the psychotic features typically resolve um, along with treatment for depression.